All right, thanks everyone online. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> we are testing out a both in-person and live event. This is our first we user group that is both online and in-person. So please uh, send us a note in chat if by any chance you cannot hear us. Uh, and then uh, hopefully if there aren't any issues, we'll get started. Hi everyone, in-person people and not in-person people. Um, this is actually the second Weave meetup I've done in the last week because um, we did one at DocuCon as well, talking about Prometheus, which was good fun. Um, so, my name is Justin Cormack. I'm an engineer at Docker. Anyway, I've been working on this project called Linux Kit, which we um, released at DockerCon, and um, we did a bunch of work, which Ilya is going to talk about a little bit later as well, um, with Weave, um, with Ilya and Luke a bit in the run-up to DockerCon and demo some stuff at DockerCon, so, which was all really good fun. So, um, Linux Kit, what is it? And why is it? Um, I've, always, I've always been an ops person by kind of uh, um, trade and history, I guess. I, 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 was, I started off in ops, really, and became a developer, I guess. Um, and one of the things that I've been interested in for a while is the whole idea of um, immutable delivery for operations. Um, I, we've all kind of getting around to the idea with containers of delivering our applications and then um, not upgrading them in, pro in, in process, but just you know redeploying them when we want a new version. But doing that with, with whole servers has been something that's been less common. There's been pioneers of it. Netflix, obviously, are well known. Um, and, it's, and it's gradually started, um, it's gradually started happening as a, as a kind of movement, but it's been much slower than I would have hoped. Um, in 2011, 2013, you know, this is four years ago, um, people talking about the fact that systems that have been upgraded are, are scary. You never know what's happened. Someone's gone and changed a bunch of config files and when you have to redeploy it, you have no idea if the thing's going to work. Or even if you have to reboot it, you've got no idea if it's going to work, come back up. I mean, that's always the nightmare as a system. So I'll just reboot it because it's got a disk problem. Oh, yes, it never came back up. Uh, the software didn't restart it. We never tested turning it back off again, down again. Um, and so this kind of came out of those ideas. And it also came out of, um, I started working on the, Docker for Mac desktop edition um, about a year and a half ago. And one of the things we needed was some Linux to go into Docker for Mac to run Docker. And I couldn't really find anything that did exactly what we wanted. So I kind of basically started building something. And it's gone through many changes, but the immutable delivery part of it has been a constant. Um, and a while back, I think it was last, well, we've been talking about open sourcing it for a while, but since about um, November, we really found a kind of pattern that we thought would be useful for other people as well. So it kind of got to the stage, it wasn't just useful internally, it was useful for other people. So we decided to open source it. Um, and the, the kind of requirements are that it's, it's a really fast system you can just build in a CI pipeline and test it like you would just a normal piece of containerized software. It's fast to run, fast to build, fast to boot, immutable. It's designed to be managed by other tooling um, and designed around containers and, and the cloud in particular. Um, so secure, portable, and lean are the kind of, and built for containers with containers. Um, we basically provide a set of secure default <laughs> containers that make up a really minimal Linux system, but you can, they're just enough to get started really, just enough to run an application like Docker or Kubernetes and bootstrap a distributed application. And then everything else you can run on top in your application layer, because that's the bits you want to run. We've got a whole community of contributors, as we've, as I mentioned, are working on it with us um, even before the launch. Um, Intel, um, HPE, um, Microsoft announced that you were going to be able to use it in their um, 
Linux containers product that they're launching on Windows Server, which is really exciting. We've been working with them for a, a long time with through through Docker for Windows and and other projects. Um, IBM we're also working on support for Bluemix. So there's there's quite a big contributors set who are kind of on board at the beginning, and more people are joining now. It's open sourced. Um, we we also we open sourced a, a small tool that builds systems, which we're using for Linux code, and we're also planning to use in, in a in a in the broader Moby project that we'll talk about another time probably. Um, this, but it's basically a set of tooling we're building for putting together distributed systems. Um, and there's a YAML file. I can um, I can show you the, a, an example YAML file. It's basically um, here's our kind of example YAML file. It's basically it's a little bit like a slightly more complicated version of Docker Compose in some ways, but designed for actually running systems. So it does things like run DHCP. Um, this is our example um, system that just runs Nginx straight off, takes the Nginx Alpine image straight off Docker Hub and builds that into a system. Um, uh, um, sorry, I, I usually have this window really zoomed in. But, um, um, yeah, so it basically runs this Nginx here, um, and we tell it to output a few outputs such as a, a, a couple of ISOs and we can we can basically build this with the seek file it will take all the components we have run C container D the kernel um, and those containers we specified um, nginx and it will output a bunch of stuff I'm going to interrupt before it finishes because I know we don't need those ones. And then we can then, I can locally run this on my Mac as a test and it will boot up Linux and it's done. Um, we can use the container D commands to list the what's running and see the processes. And that's a really, 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 really simple Linux system built and run in half a minute, which is pretty good fun compared to the hours it normally takes to build a Linux system from scratch. Um, so it's, re it's, it's really quite straightforward with these config files. Um, we built in security and we've been working on security aspects of it right from the beginning. Um, this NIST application guideline came out recently recommending that you use a container specific OS if you're running containers rather than a general purpose one because you you really should only have exactly what you need and just plan around running containers if that's all you're doing. Um, a general purpose OS will have all sorts of other stuff and it'll be more difficult to upgrade, more difficult to redeploy, more difficult to test. So we really think it's a good idea. Just include what you need. We have a modern kernel 4.9 series we're using, we're also testing 4.10. Um, we're moving system services into safe languages like Rust. We're doing fuzz testing, we're containerizing all these services, um, everything has minimal privileges, and we're testing new security advances. We've got a whole set of projects. Uh, that's on DockerCon. There's a DockerCon course. That talk will be online probably tomorrow or the next day, I think. We often use a tool called InfraKit, um, which is another Docker project that was released last year to deploy. It's a toolkit for managing real physical infrastructure or virtual infrastructure in a declarative way. You can imagine it, it's a bit like a container management thing, but for real servers. So um, you tell it you need um, six manager servers and a bunch of um, stateless servers, and it will make sure that you, it keeps those there, you can scale them up and down. It's a, it does kind of hardware scaling in the way that uh, Docker or Kubernetes does um, container scaling. And then it can also scale up the system that runs on top of that um, by adding the instances into your cluster and doing all the cluster management stuff and making sure the cluster stays up and has networking and everything's installed. So 
we found it really good to work with Infricate and Linux Kit together because it's they're kind of complementary bits of tech, and you could, we you can manage things like doing rolling upgrades automatically through Infricate. Um, you don't have to use Infricit. You can also just use other things like Terraform or um, um, any kind of tooling you like for managing on your VMware stack or CloudFormation or whatever you like. Um, we started building the Docker editions using CloudFormation for the AWS edition, but we're shifting them all over to Infricit because we found it. We can share more tooling across different clouds and different platforms. And it manages stuff really nicely. We've got a bunch of projects which um, kind of incubating in um, inside Linux Kit. One of which um, is the Kunis work that um, we're going to hear about in a second. But other, we've got ARM64 support, support for new um, LSMs and WireGuard, which is a really interesting um, lightweight VPN tunneling thing, which we want to use for container networking. Um, HP product uh, product project um, for virtualizing parts of the Linux kernel. Um, so they're all good fun. They're all in the repo. Take a look. Um, platform support now is um, really main, best support on things we've been using for development, things people have contributed recently. But we're catching up with all the things that we worked on for additions. So we'll have the really easy AWS and Azure support shortly. The Bluemix support IBM are working on Intel, working on clear containers. The ARM64 support's getting there, and the other mm. platforms. So it's pretty good. We did a lot of development on Google Cloud because it's really quick and easy for debugging because you can get a serial console and things like that. Uh, Packet.net provides bare metal hardware in the cloud, which is really convenient. We like that using them. Um, but you can also test stuff locally, on, particularly on the Mac. A lot of development is done on the Mac. You don't need a Linux machine to test Linux. It's really cool. Um, we've still got loads of work to do, so please check out the repo and join in if you're interested. And um, yeah, that was the summit last week. But really, you know, start hacking. It's it's really easy to get started. The documentation is getting there, um, but there's loads and loads of things going on. It's really good fun, and it's by far the easiest and quickest way if you want to hack, hack around the notes. It's nothing like this kind of old school. Um, learns from scratch stuff, which isn't going to end you up with the production Linux at the end. It takes you days, or trying to build, you know, kind of, if you want to, you know, trying to build your own custom version of Debian is going to take you <laughs> days to, you know, so this is really simple. If you're interested in just running containers, then um, it's, it's, it's really fun. And we're doing all sorts of things like using it for testing. So we're packaging up different distro kernels so you can really quickly test code with different kernels. Um, so we're gonna use that for internally testing components of Docker and Docker. So we can rapidly roll them out on different platforms, things like that. So there's, there's loads, of, loads of cool things you can do and it's really easy to work with and really good fun. And um, we'll be, I mean, we're shipping it in, a, in the older version on Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows and Docker for AWS, Docker for Azure, Docker for GCP. And we'll be switching over to the open source version and releasing a lot of the code that we're using on those versions as um, example code so you, you can to get, get how to get started. So you'll be able to, we'll have open source versions of those, the base, the base versions of those additions that you can use. So if you're deploying on those platforms, you'll have a, a working code base there, which is quite useful and um, if you want to build a, you know, if you want to test a cluster locally and things like that, it's all really quite straightforward. Um, it's not a finished product yet because we're still, um, it's still changing pretty quickly, but it's, um, we've had lots of people using it and fixing their bugs and writing blog posts in the last, last few days. We've had loads of blog posts on how to use it, which is helpful as well. Um, so we, Introduce. We talked to Ilya and um, Luke from Weave a few weeks before at KubeCon about um, how we really, really like to have Kubernetes working on it and having a whole um, example for that. But we kind of started working on it internally and ran out of time. Um, and um, 
So Ellie's going to talk about talk about that. Okay. So um, I don't have too many slides, but I got a couple here. Um, essentially, yeah, you all the code could be found in Linux Git repo. It's under project slash Kubernetes. Um, currently. Currently, we are using Kubernetes version 1.6. Uh, we also using kubeadm and the no. I'm a developer on GitHub, so if you if you if you, if you record an issue and uh, want to ping me, I can reply straight away. Just just find me on GitHub or Slack. So, what are the advantages of using Linux Kit to Kubernetes users? Quite specifically, there are like three advantages here. Uh, first of all, uh, you can Linux Kit allows you to build minimal and immutable OS images and ensure very reliable deployment and low security footprint in those images. So, because you are able to implement all the boot logic at the the build time. So it, it, <coughs> Let me start again. So what I was trying to say is that um, with Linux Kit, uh, you, you, you're able to do a lot more at build time, and uh, your entire OS is compiled, right? And then it just needs to put. There, there's very little logic that, that, to, uh, that has to be decided upon where, when you put uh, AVM built with Linux Kit. It is also something that makes, you, makes local development uh, much more like uh, production. Because you are able to fire up several VMs on uh, HyperKit uh, and test out your cluster locally, and and quite importantly, you, you this Linux kit, uh, you take a from scratch approach where um, instead of taking a Debian base image or uh, or a uh, Red Hat base image, you you take no base image whatsoever, you install some software on the uh, on that blank image and that's your Linux Kit VM. So there, there's, there's one kind of well-known problem there when, when you use Parker, for example, you take a, a, a multi shelf base image that you find in AWS and that's good, but then you find, you, you eventually realize that certain things changed in the base image and now you, you got to deal with those changes because the, that base image is completely out of your control. Uh, and um, Additionally to that, you, you're building much more minimal systems, right? And, um, and what I was going to say, that, yeah, that, that there's, if you're using these base images uh, in one cloud, it's not, <laughs> it's not guaranteed, uh, it's probably guaranteed, it's, it's opposite of guaranteed that the images are gonna be the same in a different cloud provider. So if you move from AWS to GCP, you would find uh, base images contain slightly different set of packages on them. So uh, the, these are the, the main three benefits. Minimal and immutable OS images, local development, uh, local cluster turnup, uh, identical to production, and uh, from scratch approach with all the benefits. Uh, uh, next I'm going to show you a demo, it will be pretty quick. And this is the same demo you, you would find on YouTube from DockerCon. Uh, okay. So I'm going to my project. Uh, it's uh, Linux uh, source uh, Docker Linux Kit. Docker Linux Kit. And um, and I go to projects Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, here I have a few files. If you read the readme, you'll understand that, that pretty much all you need to do is run bootmaster first. Then you run boot node. So I'm going to boot the master. This really takes a few moments. As I said, everything is um, uh, everything is implemented at the the boot time, at the build time, hence uh, we don't really have to uh, wait for for any any decisions to be made uh, during the the boot of this VM. Not started. Just for that, just trying to save the battery. 
Okay, here we go. Um, my VM is booting now. And all you can see here is just the, the kernel uh, messages. And that is something that uh, does take a little while now, mm -hmm. but uh, we're gonna see some optimizations in that area soon. Um, and here we go. I have a system pretty much booted. And just wait a few, a few more moments. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, so I've got uh, some images cached in this uh, VM image, so we don't have to go to the internet and download any, any images from the registry. I could theoretically do this offline, it's just that I would, you wouldn't be able to hear me because uh, I need to join Zoom. Um, so I have, <coughs> have uh, all the processes I want now. Uh, we can see there is a, uh, there is kubelet sh running here. It's not initialized yet, so we don't see a kubelet process yet. We can see Docker D uh, and uh, some container D processes, uh, NTPD, uh, there's SSHD, and a few others. But very, very minimal system, right? Um, so um, next, if you if you read the instructions, you'll find out that you want to run, run C, exec, kubelet, uh, kubeadm, in a dot sh. This is a very simple shell script to just save time typing. I don't have to memorize all the commands here. Something that I'll be looking to, to bake into the image as well. Uh, but it's currently, for, for the purpose of the demo, it's done explicitly here, it's a separate step. Uh, so this essentially runs kubeadm init, uh, which is the Kubernetes command to initialize a master, and then it installs vnet uh, add-on. Uh, we can see that uh, vnet add-on has been installed. And now we see some network-related uh, messages from the kernel. Uh, if you read the README, uh, you, 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 you find out that you need to copy this part of the command. And then you, you should be able to put a node. Uh, so I go to, to the project. So uh, Docker, uh, Linux Git, uh, projects Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, boot node, uh, and uh, I, I run boot node, and I copy these commands, so I need to give it a number. So I'm boot node number one, uh, and um, let me just copy this real quick for, uh, for the other terminal. So I don't, yeah, that doesn't, there isn't gonna be much to see here. Um, I'll uh, show you another terminal here. So while the first node is booted, I'm gonna explain. So I'm going to that directory and then I just run the boot node sh. I give it a number and I copy the join arguments for kubeadm join. Uh, so now here I need to bump the number to two or whatever like. This is, to me, this is not number two. Um, and uh, I think being able to do the third one. Let's try. Okay. Oh yeah, so the third node is button as well. Um, so here I can um, I can go into on master. This is this is a master. I can uh, run C exec kubelet um, sh not this. And see exec uh, ht, uh, and uh, here I can see that from kubectl get nodes. There are two nodes that are ready, and two are not ready yet. Uh, they're going to be ready in just a moment. We can see one more node, and the uh, fourth one is to join momentarily. Cool. That's it. Here we go. So it took a few minutes, but uh, I've done a bit of typing. I could automate this a bit more. There are a few more things that could be baked into the image. I now have a uh, four node Kubernetes cluster running uh, on, on the Mac, uh, running uh, a, a Linux image that, that you could also fire up in production that will behave exactly identically. Perhaps I could uh, talk a bit more about uh, what, uh, what makes it tick. Uh, so, if I go back to my um, uh, directory where all the code is, um, uh, 
on Docker Linux Git um, projects Kubernetes. Uh, let's make one bigger. So I have a few files here. Um, there's some garbage files here as well. I haven't cleaned up. But essentially, uh, we've got some um, Cubemaster files. So I've got Cubemaster uh, BZ image command line, uh, Cubemaster disk image, Cubemaster init RD image, and the Cubemaster YAML file that, that is a configuration file from which these, these four files are created. Uh, if I look at the, uh, at the YAML file, we can see at the top. Um, Justin showed some of this, but I might as well just walk through what there is. Uh, we can see that we are taking a, a kernel. Um, it's a 4.9 kernel. We pass uh, some arguments to the kernel, and we have uh, a series of uh, uh, init images which are extracted onto the root file system. Uh, and uh, these include init, which I believe is just an init daemon. Um, so let's say, for example, you said, well, the, the kind of init daemon there is is not my cup of tea. I kind of like to write my own init daemon or use uh, uh, one of the, the other init daemons like uh, systemd or openrc. Uh, and uh, you can really easily start experimenting with that just replacing by, by replacing just this one line, actually. Uh, next, we have run c and container d and CA certificates, which is just, just the, 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 the kind of well-known CAs. So you can, you can customize any of this really, really easily. And uh, the, these are image, uh, images and, uh, ID and tags, respective images. So essentially, what, I, what I'm trying to say there, so these, these images is something you can find on Docker Hub, uh, and you can find the source code uh, in, in Linux Kit repo uh, and customize those in whichever way you like, and they're all really quite simple. Um, so there are on-boot containers. For example, there is a syscuttle container that uh, sets up some of the default um, syscuttle, what do you call them, fields. Um, and uh, there, there is a sysfs uh, on-boot container being formed. Uh, a, um, a format container that, that formats uh, a, any persistent disks, and uh, a mount container that, that mounts any, any, any of those persistent disks you, you might want to mount. Um, uh, there are a few kind of specific things, but some of these things uh, may change, like we, we're using R shared quite a bit in here. If that's something you're familiar with, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and, um, and then, so those are the on-boot containers. Those get to run first in a sequence, one after another. Very, very simple. No complex dependency trees, stuff like that. none of that stuff. And here are the services containers, which are essentially like daemons, uh, system-level daemons. So the, the random number generator daemon, uh, DHCP daemon, and um, uh, NTPD to keep the time, and SSHD if you, if you want SSH. So if you, if, you, if you want to disable SSH on this box, you just go and delete this. And then you run uh, Linux get build, or is it mobile build? Mobile build. Um, and uh, and that, that's the thing, right? So if you, if, you, if you want to update the version of Docker, you go ahead and uh, change this number uh, uh, to whatever that is, right? Um, and uh, here are all the, the mounts that, that Docker requests. So, so Docker daemon itself, that's kind of important to know, it runs inside a container. So it's, yeah, essentially it's like an OCI container. Um, so literally nothing apart from init and uh, the, the, the container runtime, the container D and run C that runs on the host directly. Uh, so, so, so here are the, some of the optimizations we've implemented. The, this two, two, uh, these two sections uh, are about caching Kubernetes images to, to kind of speed up this demo. Um, uh, and uh, there is a kubelet container here. And uh, it's got its, all, all of its mounts. There is my SSH key. Um, and uh, the, there's some files that, so, so the, there's the file section here. This is pretty much the last one where, um, uh, things like SSH key can be uh, added, and uh, empty directories can be created. 
and uh, there's the output section where I specify that we just want the kernel uh, and the init ID uh, files to be output from this. Other formats include GCP and uh, AMI is in APR right now, I think, uh, and um, ISO and a few, few, few other and ones. VHDs. VHDs, yeah, OBF, whatever. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's uh, that's the. Um, configuration file that's used for uh, this Kubernetes demo. Uh, we, we happen to answer any questions. Do take a look at the repo if you, if you need more time looking at this and file issues or um, connect with us on Slack, Twitter, et cetera. Thanks. Okay. The, the first question was, um, how do you compare Linux kit to CoreOS? OK, so um, I think there's, I mean, CoreOS is, is a basically a, a version of Google's internal um, internal Linux version and we um, we spent quite a lot of time talking to Google about working with with them on it but um, um, <laughs> More psychedelic version. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we kind of so we yeah it's it's basically Gen two. I used to I used to use Gen two. Um, I don't use Gen two anymore. That's kind of the answer to that question. Sorry, that's it. Yeah, but um, no, I mean, I'm not the same answer. Actually. I answered it pretty much. It. But, but, yeah, um, um, it's much more difficult to customize. It's not built around containers. It's you have to build Gen2 packages. Um, there's really, um, it's it's much less straightforward and simple. Um, I think the the thing that it um, of the existing things. I think the one that's closest to it is Rancher, um, Rancher OS. I think um, we spent quite a lot of time talking to Rancher at um, Khan and. We're very much doing the same thing, and we're hoping to be able to um, work really closely with them because um, they already built something that's like that. But they use Docker rather than Container D as a runtime, which they've always been planning to change. They're, um, they're going to shift to Container D, so we're hoping to work with them really closely. But I think it's it's that's the, if the things that are out there, that's um, the most closely aligned. Um, um, but yeah, I think because those are the only two, those kids and Raja OS are the only two which are really just built from containers from the start rather than from traditional distro packages and have that distro model. We're all, also quite um, hardcore about doing the completely stateless, completely uh, just upgrade it and replace it, keep the storage volumes attached or reattach them to another machine. Whereas, um, um, CoreOS still actually install the operating system onto the hard drive, so it's, again it has a, has, a, has a sort of, and then upgrade it from there, which is again a slightly more halfway house model. I think that works quite well for Chromebooks, but I think it's less good for servers. Uh, I'm not sure if you already covered this, but can I run multiple Linux distributions in one container? Uh, not in one container. Uh, Uh, yeah, let's say so. Uh, I'll just add that essentially, you, you you can run as many containers as you like, uh, and uh, you can run any distributions inside those containers. Uh, what Linux Kit is all about is about the uh, the operating system below uh, your container runtime. Yeah. Run MySQL on those kit. Where do I store the data? What's the consistency and lifetime? So that, there's basically two ways to run things in those kit. You can either um, build them. I mean, 
we designed LearnedKit for running an orchestration system like Docker or Kubernetes, really, because that's the way we use it. Um, so that's kind of the way we expect most people to use it. But you can also run stuff directly on LearnedKit, like the examples we gave, which is actually quite fun if you just want to run stuff. You know, if you have a dedicated application or a couple of applications you want to give, donate a, a whole machine to, like, potentially a database, for example. Um, so what you do is you um, you can attach a persistent volume to your machine you're running Linux Kit on, and as um, Ilya showed in some examples, we use that obviously to, for the volume for, for Docker if you're running Docker, and you and Docker basically owns the entirety of that persistent volume. But you could also give that persistent volume just to MySQL, and then you need to manage the lifetime of that volume potentially independently. Of Machine, so that might be a you know a volume in AC in AWS that you attach to that machine. MySQL runs with it, and then when you want to upgrade MySQL or you want to upgrade the kernel or you want to upgrade, change something else about your Linux setup, you um, unattach that volume and then reattach it to a to a to a basically to a new machine. And Infrakit actually has lifetime management stuff for volumes like that. So um, we have a whole model where um, you can have, you can keep volumes attached um, and reattach them later. There's also people working on Netscape with hardware platforms and Infrakit on hardware platforms where you actually manage the physical machines like that. So you would then um, reboot a new version of Netscape on the same machine that had the same drive attached, if you're using physical drives or if you're using a SAN, then you reattach it with the, with the storage on it. So it's kind of, um, it's not maybe dissimilar from container volume management, but actually at the, at the machine level rather than, the, rather than the, the volume level. And in some ways, the, um, the, the support's actually slightly better than it is for, I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of more well understood if, if you're into infrastructure and how you do things on infrastructure. Yeah, and that, that would be something, that, that storage layer would be something you would use for, uh, for um, SCD storage, for example, in the Kubernetes setup. So you can implement an HA control plane, and I would end up using that as something that I have to do. Yes. Yes. I mean, for, um, yeah, I mean, it all depends on, yeah, if you, on, your, on your application architecture, but um, I completely, we should have some, we should have some proper work, worked examples for all the um, design for the clustering side of it and the lifetime side, side life cycle side of it coming, coming up. We've been, been doing a lot of work. Any part of uh, integrating something like Minikube? Any plans of integrating something like Minikube? A good, very good question. Uh, well, um, I wonder which parts of Minikube we would integrate with. Um, I mean, you see, you see, one of the problems with Minikube is uh, that uh, you the way Kubernetes is run inside of Minikube is very, very different from how you would run it in production. So if you, if you, if you get to debug an issue with uh, performance on Minikube versus performance in production, you, you will be looking at a very different system. So just, just to, to illustrate this a little bit more, uh, on Minikube, uh, you have a single process running all of the Kubernetes control plane components called local queue. And in production, you probably have those components uh, separated out over. You, you know, not probably, but uh, very, definitely. <laughs> you'll definitely have that. If you, unless you're running OpenShift, but with OpenShift, it's a different story. Um, with OpenShift, uh, in all cases, you would have single process running things. So let's say, uh, you know, in a production system, you look at it and you see, oh, SCD is eating too much CPU, uh, and then you can narrow it down. Whereas local cube, it's very hard to narrow down which part of the system is, is working correctly. Because it's a Kubernetes, it's a CD, it's control, controller manager, it's the API server, it's all of those things uh, running inside a single process. 
So and, uh, that is essentially one of the problems, and, uh, and th th that is why we're talking about the advantage of having identical systems in development. Question. So, we have a question online. Uh, will this work with ARM APIs and Odroid XU4 and would like to see the right. Linux kit with Kubernetes run? We're working on the ARM support. It's one of the things that ARM are working on with us, and we've got people working on it. It's not there yet, but we're hoping to have it in the hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, so we've just we've got a bit of work to do to make it as easy to just use on ARM as it is on um, x86. Um, we're actually starting with ARM64, um, but ARM HF. There's a lot of we know there's a lot of ARM. We had hoped to get it done for DockerCon, but unfortunately we ran out of time. So, um, soon, yeah. And another question, um, Steve, maybe you can reiterate, I'm not clear, but how do you take this off the laptop now, for example, run it in VMware Fusion? Yeah, I mean, basically, um, generally all you have to do um, is, there's a bunch of different output formats at the end of the YAML file that you tell it that you want to output um, VMDK rather than um, the kernel in it renders, which is what Hypercate uses, it will output the VMDK and you put the VMDK instead. In practice, there might be a few things that are slightly different. Um, we're trying to have a common metadata config layer that is portable across different cloud platforms, but you might, you might have to adjust that a teeny bit, but generally, um, yeah, you adjust the output format and then you just boot, boot the the BMDK rather than the ISA or whatever whatever your platform needs. We're integrating a bunch of stuff to make that really easy so you can um, build all the images at the same time, which you can do now, and then you can just push them to um, cloud platform and then just run them with um, those kit push, those kit run, and they just run. So um, in, most case, in most cases, the images of the different platforms are totally identical. So it's really easy to shift, to move from one to the other, um, and we're trying to make yeah all the metadata handling, user data handling, I don't common between the platforms, so that it's even easier. Yeah, so outside now, you have to build like a container D, and you can put files and stuff like that. Rocket, for example. Um, outside, we couple to container D. Do we find something like Rocket? Um, right now, um, we um, right now we're not terribly tightly coupled to container D itself. We're actually more tightly coupled to run C because the config files are basically OCI fields, and then um, most of the versions until just before DockerCon were actually directly using run C, not container D, because container D was still because we're using the container one point out that's still being under development. So um, if you've got an OCI compliant runtime, which Rocket is not at the moment, but so they may be in future, then you could use that. Um, the, um, we are going to use some of the um, container D image store stuff to store the images, because the moment we unpack all the root file systems, which means you get a bit of duplication and stuff like that. So it's, we're going to rewrite it to use the container D code for that. Um, it would be possible to do um, something else instead of that. Um, I mean, I think it would be definitely possible to adapt it as it now is to use Rocket, but it might get a little bit more difficult when we use the container the image code, but you could change that back to something more like we're using now or rewrite it. Um, I mean, the actual um, the stuff that boots up is pretty straightforward. I mean, it really just wants OCI compatible containers, so it's quite low level. That's why the files are quite verbose at the moment, because you have to specify everything from scratch. It doesn't make assumptions like Docker does, and you have to specify all the routes and things like that, which is what you want to the system container there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you, you could probably build something 
never replaced it all. And um, you might need some minutes to think on top. But there's, there's nothing. There's literally nothing that you don't that you get on the build system that is not in the config file. Um, so it makes it, it makes no. It doesn't force you into any decisions. But some of the sort of things kind of assume at least you've kind of got some ACI. Yeah. We have a two-part question online, which is. Builds the Linux kit kernel images. And follow up question Is this something difficult? Could companies build their own kernel images if they wanted to own the whole process? Yeah, so the kernel images that we provide are the ones that we use for the Docker editions. You, um, and so we do a bunch of testing on them and um, security settings and some of that. But it's trivial to replace them with your own one. All you have to do is provide. A, um, a image on the registry which has the actual kernel binary and a tarball with um, the modules or whatever else you want to mark that. And then you can just run your own kernel. So we're just working on a bunch of scripts to use the standard um, Ubuntu and, uh, kernels because um, we want to be able to test software with Ubuntu kernels really easily because we want to be able to test um, Docker on a wide range of different kernels because that's what other people run. So um, yeah, it's really, really easy to replace the kernel with your own thing. As all, all the image names in the YAML file are, uh, are just images that you pull from registry. You can push your own, use them, change the names, do what you want. There's no requirement to use any of our stuff. We hope you'll use our stuff because it's, we, it, work, we'll, it kind of works, but um, you're absolutely, absolutely fine to use any other. Then you want it's, a kit. it's it's called Linux Kit because it's a kit. It doesn't force doesn't force you into any any decisions, but we do provide useful components along with the kit, so you can play with it. Obviously. It is actually really really easy to to build to use any of the, the images. For example, you you could take uh, the Kubernetes version out that are uh, and uh, <coughs> replace the kernel there. And you, you could merge that with uh, old kernel project within the repository and use the uh, fancy HP old kernel stuff. Um, then you, you can find out more if you, if you look into the documentation of that project. And you, you can do all of those things if you just drive on a cluster with like whatever kernels you like. Whatever you make it it's great for, I mean, the, changing the kernel is, is great for testing because. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I work on on Docker, and we have so many issues that are about problems with particular kernel versions, and it's just really time consuming to um, run testing on that. But we, one of the engines that we're going to just be able to, I mean, we, we, for our CI for Nanoscape, we just spin up Google Cloud machines just to run single tests on new machine with a specific kernel. An exact config that we want, run the tests, tear, tear down the machine. Um, how, you know, we're going to extend that to a really broad range of testing across multiple kernel versions just for testing our software. So, we really encourage people to, to use it for things like that if you've got that thing. Because it's much easier than trying to boot up some version of Ubuntu with a particular kernel version that your customers use. What about Docker Machine? Yeah, um, um, we, th <laughs> we think that, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I think that if, I find that it's going to be easier to use than Docker Machine uh, for doing the stuff I want to do. Um, I mean, Docker Machine is kind of still there. It's actually got some useful stuff, but we I think we'll end up building something that covers 95% of the machine use cases pretty soon. I mean, it's, there are, there's lots of customization people have done around docking machine, but um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of production type workflow. This, this provides both a dev workflow and a production workflow that are the same, and docking machine never provided that. 
Yeah, and uh, to your previous question about Minikube, uh, Minikube uh, uses Leap Machine and inherits most of the user problems that there were always. Actually, with that, um, I'm speaking to the camera here. <laughs> so um, we're out of time. I know a lot of talking. Um, we have a bunch of questions still online, so I'll just make sure that we either will follow up directly with um, questions and or that come up here. Maybe we'll write a blog post that covers it. Should something we've yeah, been thinking about doing is yeah. uh, covering um, so many questions. That you come mean you haven't written a blog post? Yet? <laughs> no, no, no. We, like a blog yeah. post specifically yeah, for yeah. all these questions yeah. that come in at our meeting. Oh, yeah. got tons. Yes. But um, anyway, thanks for joining online and thanks for joining in person. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. I know it's logistically kind of crazy. So thanks for your patience online. And uh, we'll see you in the next user group. Thanks. Bye.